Uh, I want to welcome people to this, this research seminar at the, at the Kiev School of Economics and the, the, as part of the, the global scholarly involvement uh, to support uh, the continuation of good, solid thinking about problems of, of, of economics and, and society at the Kiev School of Economics, even as, as their nation is struggling for to, in, to, to, to prevail in, 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 a, in a, a war for, to defend their independence. Um, I'm very gl glad to, to let me, oh, I'm very glad to introduce Steve Durloff today. This is my job and really my only job, except also to say, Steve, has, as, as, as speaker, has accepted that, that um, uh, people in the audience who want to raise their hands uh, uh, using the, the, uh, the raise hand button um, or uh, are, can, can, will it, with an appropriate lag perhaps be, be unmuted by, uh, by, by members, by co-hosts? Uh, Minea Konstantinou and 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 Kala are are are, are will function on, uh, taking care of that, and so uh, we we hope to have a real discussion. Um, if people want to write longer questions in the Q and A, we may get to them later. But if you want it, if you'd like to 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 make a comment or question, uh, raise your hand and, uh, and 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 at some point you'll be unmuted and we'll say so. Um, it is a great great pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Durloff. Uh, um, he has made broad and deep contributions to our understanding of growth, of economic growth and inequality. Uh, since 2017, he's been the Steens Professor at Educational Policy at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, which means that we're colleagues. Uh, um, I should note that previously he was the Kenneth J. Arrow Professor of Economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which in my opinion is is just about the best title anybody could possibly have in a, in a chaired professorship. Among many contributions listed in his CV, he served as general editor of the New Palgrave Dictionary of Economics and as editor of the Journal of Economic Literature. And I mention these because they, they indicate A, that he's done great service to our profession and B, if he can do that, then he clearly knows about everything in economics. But today, Steve will talk about a trajectory-based approach to measuring intergenerational mobility. And with that, I cede to you, Steve. Oh, th thank you. Um, thank you, Roger, for that, 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 that flattering introduction. Um, I think it's inevitable that, um, uh, that I, I need to start with you know, some, some comments about the extraordinary circumstances in which the, uh, uh, what am I done? I, uh, I'm speaking. I'm sorry if I, I'm coming across as disorganized and nervous. Uh, I, I wanted to say two things. One, uh, when I was a uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, must be 20 over 20 years ago, there was a uh, a very interesting Ukrainian graduate student who uh, was one of my first year advisees, and his name is uh, Timothy uh, Molovinov. And um, at the time, he was obviously a very nice guy, exceptionally smart, and of course went on to many successes in, in academia. What I don't think I could have forecast is that uh, he defines what it means to be a hero in the 21st century, and I don't use that to flatter uh, all of you at the Kiev School, uh, and obviously I have a personal connection to, to Timothy, so he sits in my mind. Are 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 defining uh, or fulfilling what Hemingway said was the definition of courage, which is grace under pressure. And so, uh, I, I want to say more than that. Express solidarity. I want to express thanks. And that is in a in a, in a world in which, frankly, the West has I think been in a moral slumber for the last thirty years. You've uh, you've re-energized uh, the the need to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil, and to uh, and to act accordingly. So I'm uh, I, I'm profoundly grateful to all of you. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say was that I do have a personal connection to Ukraine. My grandmother on my father's side was born in Dnipro, in Dnipro, in Dnipro. I'm not going to pronounce things correctly. In 1899, and I have a very this is a true story. I'm making it up for you. Uh, I, one story she told me when she emigrated to the U.S. in uh, in 1906 is that she remembered as an 18 year old in 1917 literally dancing in the streets of the part of uh, Manhattan she lived in when the announcement came that the Tsar had abdicated along with other uh, immigrants of that time. So 
I, I will be honest, I'm having hopes that uh, her grandson will, will soon have a, a, a similar memory that he can pass on to his, uh, his grandchildren. Um, so with that, let me, uh, let, let me turn to the paper. And this is a, a long paper. And uh, it, the, uh, I should say the ink is not quite dry, so the draft should be ready to circulate. And please email me for it um, uh, if you want to see. Um, it's called the Trajectory-Based Approach to Measuring Intergenerational Mobility. Let me first emphasize that it's co-authored with uh, three wonderful co-authors, Yu Sung Chang and Jun Park, who are, of course, uh, world-class econometric theorists. And, uh, they, it, and this paper very much fulfills one of my uh, graces as a, in my academic career is to always have extraordinarily talented co-authors. And so I want to emphasize how integral they obviously are to the methodology. And then I want to mention Sung Hee Lee, who is a wonderful graduate student in Indiana, who is moving to the uh, Korean Development Institute and has been in every uh, every sense a uh, an essential co-author to this. So, given the uh, the time constraints, what I want to do in the talk is, um, um, in essence, the following, and that is that basically make an argument to you. And so, you know, I, I there's a there's a ton, ton of slides here. I'm sure I'm not going to get through them, but I hope to persuade you at the end. There's something to think about. And I think the background is everybody knows inequalities is is a, a you know, re receiving enormous professional attention now, and uh, it's, it, there's been really a, a, a renaissance of, of research, and uh, and that renaissance to some extent has focused on on issues of measurement. And I, what this paper wants to do is to complement that renaissance uh, so immodestly in that sense by focusing on issues of. Um, of, of actually how to characterize intergenerational mobility. And so what I mean by that is that much of the advance in this literature has been generated by new data sets. In other words, you have much broader populations and time periods over which you can calculate statistics that measure intergenerational mobility. This paper wants to say something about the uh, statistics that are perhaps most interesting. And so what's going to be essential here is the idea that uh, in thinking about intergenerational mobility, there's a background intuition, which is mobility or its lack thereof is defined as the extent to which the experiences of a child uh, and be concrete, we'll say from birth to age 18, how those experiences condition what happens to them as adults. And in particular, how the nature of their family conditions, uh, what the, uh, the outcomes are as adults. And so what this paper is going to do is it's going to think about that problem by explicitly modeling intergenerational mobility via trajectories. And so the thought experiment is going to be that a child has family exposures. One set of exposures are the incomes that the family has throughout uh, childhood and adolescence. Another exposure is family structure. And one can, and in, I would say in, in sequels to this paper, uh, there will be other types of exposures that are studied, but here it's really gonna focus on the interplay of family income and family structure. And so the objective in all this is to say that one as a statistical exercise, as an econometric exercise, one wants to measure that mapping, that if I know, you know, what are the predictions for children, if I know the trajectories of family structure and the trajectories of income, and from that, draw conclusions about the, uh, the nature of mobility. So in order to kind of give you the background as to what's going on, the, 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 the classic way to measure intergenerational mobility, and here I will talk about absolute mobility, the Chetty work, which you're undoubtedly familiar with, focuses on relative, but the principles would be the same thing. And that, you know, the, the way to understand that literature is, is that it is really looking for bivariate relationships. And so the thought experiment is to say that there's something called permanent income of a parent. And that's typically measured by taking the average over a long interval of parental incomes, and you call that the permanent income. And so you have in the background of that the notion there's a, a signal that's a permanent income and an associate and then transitory income simply noise. And when regresses the associated object for children against that of parents. And so this intergenerational elasticity of income is the uh, is the key statistic that is used in, in thinking about mobility. So if somebody says that uh, Norway is more mobile intergenerationally than the United States, that statement is coming down to, to the claim that, mo that the, the beta for Norway is in, let's say 0.2 for the, you know, to give you a, a ballpark estimate, whereas the United States would be closer to 0.45. 
And so that's become, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the coefficient that's launched a thousand papers and, um, and is, you know, an understanding is obviously of first order significance, not just positively to understand the nature of inequality, but normatively, because we have very powerful ethical intuitions, which are going to be formalized, of course, that, uh, that that family background is exactly this sort of object that, um, that that can create unjust inequalities when you equate unjust inequalities with inequalities for which a person is not responsible. And of course, there's a, a theoretical literature that generates these types of models. And uh, I think I would say a couple of things about it. One of them is the theoretical literature uh, that's used to provide the micro foundations of this probably should be teased a little bit because it's really just two period overlapping generations models. And so in that sense, what it's doing is it's collapsing the trajectories of childhood and adolescence. And I would say, but beyond that, the more serious point would be that um, there's an assumption that the timing of parental income is irrelevant. In other words, every uh, every sequence of incomes that produces the same average would give you the same same implications for uh, for children. Now, you can obviously see a couple of reasons why that wouldn't uh, be appropriate. One of them would be the natural one, which there can be credit constraints. The ability to borrow against future incomes would be would be problematic. The second uh, that we might come to mind, which does not get enough attention, of course, is that the parents themselves are changing across time. Uh, I think most parents flatter themselves that they're better parents when the child's 10 than uh, zero, only in the sense they learn something over time. And so the point is that the agents that are interacting with the children themselves are evolving. So what is the mobility measure we want to propose as an alternative? Well, it's going to be one that respects that there are trajectories in childhood and adolescence. And operationally, it's going to be what's called a functional regression. And so there's going to be a measure of permanent income for the child as before. But the objects that determine that are going to be essentially functions. And so the idea is that there's going to be this XI that's a trajectory of parental influence or family influence from ages P to Q. And those will be zero to 18 to make it concrete. And it's going to take a continuous time representation. Obviously, there's data come in discrete time. And so that's one of the issues that has to be addressed in implementation. But the thought experiment is, is a mapping of the trajectories to permanent income. And what this is going to do is to give a specific responses to each of the characteristics of the families as the child is transiting across, uh, across, across childhood and adolescence. And so what that's going to do is to produce a more complicated object to estimate. And it's going to produce not a, a number, it's going to produce actually its own function. And that function is going to be beta, which is a function of the age of the child. Now in doing that, notice that it's, we're gonna end up producing uh, more than simply, oh, rather than have a scalar, have a, uh, have a function that describes the, uh, the intergenerative elasticity. It's going to allow us to think about the question differently as to what it is about a child's family background that determines mobility. And what I mean by that is that, you know, in thinking about kind of where this, this type of research would go, is one wants to say that there's certain sets of trajectories that make it likely a child will have economic success, graduate from college, think about certain things that uh, we associate with affluence. There'll be other sets of trajectories that collectively have the same predictions in terms of likelihood of disadvantage. And so what one wants to do is to understand, and you know, so what's going to talk about a mobile society, one of them is going to ask how different those uh, sets could be. In other words, if all the sets give the same answers, that's a very mobile society. So you want to know the differences between the two. But the second thing that becomes interesting is the question of resilience. Look within the uh, set of, uh, of, of trajectories that predict success and see where they differ from one another. That'll tell you it's, something it's, about where family uh, resilience occurs. Tim, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Uh, Jan, Jan, Jan here. Um, when, when you said that the timing matters, the example you gave was one about causal effects, right? About maybe when you make your educational decisions, it's important that your parents have enough income so you don't run into credit constraints. Mm -hmm. But there could also be more like a um, descriptive aspect about it, right? That, for example, parents who have steep income growth, they are somehow different, right? And maybe it's not about the income per se, it's just in, an, in a predictive sense um, the, the, that matters. And that relates to the question of, you know, when, 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 you, when you look at this IGE, are you mostly interested in lifetime income, which is more about these predictive statistical questions, 
or are you interested in something like permanent income, right? Which is more about income having causal effects. How, how do you think about it in, in, in the context of your, your paper? Well, let, let, me, let me divide, it's a, it's a deeper question that gets a fast answer. So let me divide it into a couple of pieces. One, the paper itself is purely about prediction. It wants to say that if I want to predict the permanent income of children, which I'll take as an interesting statistic, but it's not the only statistic we look at. We also look at educational attainment and occupational attainment uh, for the children. We want to move beyond saying there's a scalar characteristic of the families that, that, that it predicts those. And so we want to understand as a statistical matter what the trajectories look like. You asked the question that the paper can't ultimately resolve, which is going to be issues of in the interpretation of mechanisms. And so, in uh, in, in in spilling the uh, you know giving away the, one of the plot lines, we're going to find that the uh, the sensitivity of income is rising with age. That's inconsistent with the conventional stories. Well, it, not logically inconsistent, but I think not that doesn't sit easy with the idea that that early childhood investments are constrained because of credit, and that's really what's causing inequality. What I like in your, what is appealing in what you said is I think the families are on upward trajectories. They're simply different types of families. If you ask, and what I will conjecture later on is those families create aspirations in their children that are different than families that are exhibiting downward mobility across the life course. So I, I think that the results we're gonna, I'm going to present they're they're not the ones that the, that I'm going to I'm going to assert they're not what theory would have or at least conventional wisdom would have predicted. And they suggest that there's some new channels that need to be looked at with respect to mechanisms. But I want to be clear uh, by itself, these types of exercises don't, don't, don't solve identification problems. Great, thanks. Okay, now in thinking about this, as I said, you, you know, there are gonna be some ideas that are in the background and a lot of, the, when I said there's a theoretical or, or literature that, that it addresses, that's gonna be the work that pioneered by, by Heckman, uh, Cunha, Heckman, Cunha, Heckman, and Shanak, which has tried to think about the evolution of skills in children and has been quite explicit about the roles of childhood and adolescence. And so there they have, a, you know, there's gonna be one idea there is that certain periods of, uh, of, of childhood and adolescence, there's, 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 there's sens excess sensitivity. The analogy there, of course, is it's easier to learn a language before a puberty than after. Uh, but there's a general idea in this in the literature that uh, that there's certain sensitivities that are time specific. The second idea that's pushed in the literature is that there's strict dynamic complementarity between investments at different ages. We're going to actually find more complicated story. So, you know, what's an example of a trajectory? And so the idea would be that you could sort of here's a you know, hypothetical. You think about you know parental income at different ages. And what you could do is every age ask what the predict the, the effect is on the predictions and you sort of can go through a, a sequence of events in which as an example you want to say there's something about the child at birth that matters and i said hypothetically the parents are together they have a certain income they live in, in the west coast and as a native of california and of course that's a great virtue then you could look at them at four and then you're going to get a very different prediction if it is the case that at age four the father is now unemployed and the parents are now split up. And then so you can sort of work through different, you know, different stories of that type. And that's really what we're trying to characterize. All right. Now, preview of coming attractions is that if you were to take the linear approach, what you would end up with is a sequence of uh, predictions with respect to income that obviously so says there's one, one number that fits everybody. In contrast, we're going to end up with trajectory statements about these sensitivities at different ages. So let me, uh, you know, start by giving you a full summary of what the results are, and then I'll go as far as I can into the nitty gritty. So the first result is going to be that, uh, that, that there's clear evidence of age-specific IgE effects, and it's going to—they're going to take on a um, a, uh, a particular pattern, and that is that there's a near monotonicity. So in other words, if you think about this beta function as opposed to a beta scalar, the function has the property that except for the uh, uh, you know, very late adolescence is monotonically increasing in income. And so the key message there is that there's going to be uh, uh, a important information loss if one simply collapses the trajectory of parental incomes into a single number. The second thing I want to say is that the work is going to is going to generalize in a particular way to thinking about interactions across different ages. So what do I mean by that? The baseline intergenerational mobility models have the property that they're linear, of course, 
the functional data and analog to this is going to also be a linear model. It just has a more complicated set of variables that are being added together to produce the, uh, the forecast and the predictions of the children. We will generalize that to um, introduce a quadratic form of functional data analysis, which is just going to be a second order. You could say it's arbitrary functions. I added another term of the Taylor series expansion. That is from the perspective of theory, and certainly my own work, not the best way to introduce nonlinearities, but there's an enormous, there's two, there's two advantages to it. Number one, there are recursive dimensionality issues that you have to address if you really want to go all the way and not be parametric. But more importantly, what's going to happen is you have this, you're going to have essentially a matrix of cross partial derivatives. How does the sensitivity of one, a uh, dollar in one period affected by a dollar in another? That's going to be providing a way to think about dynamic complementarities and in income, as well as the potential for dynamic substitutes. Similarly, you can do the same thing for family structure. So what's going to happen there is, is that our results speak pretty clearly to the idea that in fact, there is not uniform complementarity, nor is there uniform substitutability. Roughly speaking, if you look within early childhood, there's, there is substitutability. In other words, the, it, a dollar one year versus a dollar another year when the child's uh, one or two, the cross partials are, are, are pretty systematically negative. Same thing is true within adolescence identified in isolation, uh, uh, middle and late adolescence. On the other hand, and this is back to where I think the, the, the idea that early childhood investment has long-term you know, benefits in terms of what happens later on, what one finds is there's complementarity globally, non-locally. So if you were to compare ages of early childhood versus adolescence, that's where you get uh, uh, cross partials that are positive. So I think you could say, that, you know, in some sense, that sounds like a little, excuse me, a little bit of a, uh, of a, of, of a paradox, but I think it, it actually isn't. It just says that the actual, you know, the, the literature that finds uniform complementarity does it because they work with functional forms in which either everything is a substitute or everything's a complement. When you relax that restriction, then, a, then an interpretable pattern emerges. The third thing to say is that uh, if you look at family structure dynamics, and I don't think this will really shock anybody, but nevertheless, you can measure the distinct role that family structure has for, um, uh, for predicting mobility. I would say that with reference to the kind of trajectories we generate on family structure, mid-teen years, single parent households, that's where you're getting the uh, clearest evidence that that's having a, ne a negative consequence for future permanent income. And second thing to say is that there's some interesting findings in terms of complementarity between income and family structure. And so what that means is if you sort of look in early childhood in isolation, you find complementarity. If you look at late adolescence and isolate middle and late adolescence and isolation, you find complementarity. On the other hand, there seems to be substitutability between early and late years. So in other words, an early divorce, its effects are attenuated if the, if the family has a high income later in life. So the upshot is that this provides a quote unquote principled way to introduce a uh, principled way to actually measure, comp me measure complementarities and substitutes, which does not impose uh, a claim that they all have the same sign. And so you can get, you know, both of these are giving, I think, somewhat richer stories. The final thing to say is that one can go beyond income as the uh, thing you predict for children to think about the, the, prox the, the proximate determinants of income. Now, obviously, there's many proximate determinants, but the two that uh, we focus on are educational attainment and occupation. Let me add parenthetically that I think that economists have been uh, uh, remiss in not taking, uh, you know, in not respecting the focus on occupation that drives the sociological literature on intergenerational mobility. And I think that um, I mentioned that because I think that part of what we hope to accomplish in the, uh, you know, in this paper is to give a more comprehensive vision of the mobility process that respects the role of occupation. For our purposes, I think the key is to say that if you're, you know, if you're sort of asking what determines your income, knowing the occupation and education, that gets you a lot. And so one can go through exactly the same exercises and ask what sort of trajectories produce different types of occupations and which ones produce different types of educational levels. And, it's a, and what I would say is that there, again, we find mid to late adolescent years, that seems extremely important in explaining offspring uh, education and occupational attainment. 
So if you combine all of this together, there's a kind of a bottom line, which is that from the vantage point of the empirical work done in this paper, we find, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I will say, I, I think persuasive evidence that, that it's important to think about the family inputs in later years. Are there any questions? Um, I have a quick question. If uh, Please. I, I was wondering about the, when, you, when you presented the functional form, I was thinking that two individuals that face the same parent's income potentially can face different outcomes because their betas are going to be different across the individuals. And, and somehow this points to some form of context that, that's perhaps not captured by that particular dimension. And now you're mentioning all these cross derivatives, but I was thinking, you know, there's maybe five or six dimensions that we would want to take into account. Um, how, how do we know, how shall I say this? Um, how do we know what's, what's driving that different impact across individuals? So, you know, you come from the same family, same structure, same income, but some people earn so much more. All right, so let me divide the question into two parts. One is to say the sequel paper to this one is actually to be explicit about school and neighborhood effects. Oh, okay. In other words, one, one, one way to ask the question, suppose I have two individuals, and they have the family trajectories are the same. You know, what would explain the, the predictions, uh, the, you know, the differences in income outside of saying, oh, that's the epsilon, that's not an interesting answer. I think the obvious thing that's missing in this is that this is a, a model that's looking at family specific inputs. And so the sequel paper is to look at neighborhoods versus uh, uh, and schools versus family specific objects. So that's kind of that. That's where I think we have the biggest gap here. The second way to interpret your question is you'd like to allow the beta functions themselves to exhibit heterogeneity, and and so that would. And so again, stepping back and thinking about that, one way you could do that, and this is what's um, is what if I can engage in some uh, uh, shameless self promotion in a recent paper that. Um, uh, Andros Kotelich, Xi Ming Tan, and I wrote on the Great Gatsby Curve, we go through a, a systematic discussion of what it means to allow the beta to depend on different variables and what the consequences are. And so that, that's the way you would proceed in, uh, in introducing that type of richness. And so I mentioned that because once you, you know, once you set it up kind of the way that we did in the paper, you can then understand what it is the linear approximations are doing for different, different subsets of the population. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. So let me mention um, that there's, you know, there, there is a literature that, that this speaks to. I want to, there are two papers that I, you know, uh, I would strongly recommend that are, uh, you know, think about things differently, but are important. One of them is by uh, sociologists Jeff Watke, uh, David Harding, and Felix Elward that looks, but they actually do the, the neighborhood and, uh, and, uh, and, and family income relationships. Similarly, there's work by Carnero, Garcia, Salvanas, and Tamane that uh, using uh, Norwegian data are actually looking at stages of income in, uh, in, 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 in three parts of, of childhood and adolescence. The key difference is there is these papers are going to have basically say you can divide income into like you know, early, middle, and late uh, uh, zero to 18, or you know, something similar in terms of having these, these broad categories. Uh, the other thing, and so the results ought to be you know, thought of as kind of extending that type of philosophy. I also want to emphasize this is not the first paper that to use functional data analysis. Uh, there was a paper by Chosé, Cheng, and Couch, and I don't know why we've updated it to 2021 on the slide, because the last version I saw was 2006, which uses functional data analysis. And then as a paper that I have with Andros Cortellos and, uh, and Constantine E, who also is using these methods. And so I want to emphasize that um, this is a contribution that, you know, I, obviously I think there's novelty in the paper, I read it otherwise, but there are the other people, you know, there are scholars have been thinking about this functional approach. And so um, this is very much complementary to that type of work. Okay. So what I want to do is I'm going to make a couple of comments about a common, basically explain the econometric methodology, uh, not in detail, but kind of what's going on in it, you know, what's going to make, make everything work. And uh, I, I was, was going to say the, the way that I want to do that is to contrast it to uh, what was done here to what I'm going to call the conventional approach. I've made a big deal about saying, oh, we really want to map trajectories of things into predictions of, of objects for children, to which one answer you could give is, 
been there, done that, that's called a panel. In other words, why not just regress whatever the thing it is I care about, the permanent income of the child in this case, against the income at every age? After all, that's a trajectory of coefficients. Well, and the answer is that's the, that, that in some sense is what is done traditionally in the literature. It is not the case that one literally runs a regression of, inc of the permanent income against 18 uh, uh, age specific incomes, but rather you get divisions into early, middle, and late childhood or something like that. But nevertheless, that's the philosophy of all this. Okay, everybody with me? And so when I say to you, there's going to be a, a new way to do things methodologically, I invoked this term functional data analysis, it's going to be a different way of doing calculations. And somehow, if there's the, one's going to make a case, it has to be that in contrast to this panel approach, it has certain virtues. You know, it's going to have those virtues, and that's why having such wonderful econometricians as co-authors is essential because they've worked on those virtues. And so there's a number of results that have been identified that's going to justify the approach. Okay, so what would that mean? What it would mean is, is an example that uh, I, I could sort of think about a sequence of interval models of coefficients. I'm calling that the conventional approach. If I divided uh, zero to 18 between the first nine years and the second nine years, those are intervals, there's two. If I divide into three uh, inter intervals of six, that's another way to do that. And so what you can think about is that you're going to, for each time that you, you know, you consider different divisions of the data, one's going to end up with a sequence of coefficients. What I would emphasize is that when you actually do this with the PSID data, these are the sorts of results you get. You go from 10 to 20, um, so on and so forth. You end up with a sequence of, I think the term I want to use is erratic answers. And here's the serious thing I want to say. The issue with the conventional panel approach, there's actually, there's kind of two things to think about. Number one, if I run a regression with a bunch of highly collinear variables, obviously the, the parents' incomes are they exhibit substantial dependence at different ages, it shouldn't be a shock that you get extraordinarily imprecise estimates. The second thing to say, which is maybe less obvious, is it turns out that the, the estimates will also be unstable. In other words, changing the divisions, you have things moving up and down like this. And so it's not there, the, the ability to, there's a fragility there that's more than simply saying the variance is high. It's actually saying the coefficients themselves are fluctuating all, uh, in ways that render them uninterpretable. So that's the kind of the, that's the unkind thing I wanted to say about the, uh, the conventional approach. So what's going to go on here? And so I'm 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 I, I I'm gonna uh, I'm sorry that Timothy isn't here because uh, but I, I see some former Wisconsin students are here. So now they're going to find out why when I teach introductory macro, the first thing I do is talk about Hilbert spaces <laughs> because it's going to turn out that all of the analysis here is basically going to be based on on Hilbert space ideas. Okay. So what do I mean by that somewhat pompous sounding phrase? What I mean is the following, and that is that um, in thinking about this idea that uh, permanent income is is equal to this integral plus noise, you know, what, what am I, what's going to be going on in the background? What's going to be going on in the background is that the key is I need to estimate this object beta. And I need to think about um, this integral, uh, you know, as, as, the, as basically the interaction of two functions. One of them was beta and the other was a function of, that was the incomes. Now, of course, the incomes are stochastic or are stochastic process. All right. So here's the point that what I'm going to have is this complicated object, that integral, that's itself a random variable, and that's going to live in a space. And so the trick's going to be, I want to think about that space of random variables as having a countable basis. All right. Now, why is that a big deal? The answer is because once you have a cannibal basis, then we start thinking about regressors again. In other words, I'm going to have objects that I get to project things against. And so what I want to say is, okay, and so I'm going to skip, this is where I'm going to start engaging in my usual annoying activity, which is skip a lot of slides. I want to say there's going to be a particular decomposition that's going to matter. And that's called the, uh, the Gaharian law of expansion. And what it says is if I have a if I have this space of random functions in continuous time, there's still going to be a cannibal basis for it. And the way I think about the cannibal basis is the basis is going to be time varying non-random functions. 
and the weights are going to be time independent random variables. And so the point is that then you figure out what is the best choice of the time specific functions such that if I was going to use those to, uh, to do my projections, I'm going to get the most accurate estimates. Okay, so that's all that that's what's going on here. Now, the upshot is going to be the following. And that is that the trick in doing this is that you think about the random function X as having a variance covariance matrix. It's and again, any, you know, any, any set of random variables has that obviously an accountable infinity was going to have the same thing. So what you can calculate off of that are associated eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. All right. So the way that you do the approximation is you use a finite number of eigenfunctions based on the variance covariance matrix. And you choose them in such a way that you're doing the equivalent of principal components. The first eigenfunction is the one that soaks up the most variance of the X function. The second one is what soaks up the most that's left over. So in principal components analysis, the idea is you've got a bunch of random variables and you sort of say what combination explains most of the collective variance, so on and so forth. You can generalize that to doing the same thing for random functions. And so that's going to be, that's where the hard econometrics comes into play. And that's where you get, uh, you know, important optimality properties. And what do I mean by optimality properties? The first is that for any finite approximation, which you have to do obviously given finite data, that choice of basis for the underlying space will give you the best approximation. Now, after all, that isn't that what you, that's what you're going to want for efficiency. The second thing is, because it's a nice orthogonal basis, the stuff you've left over is orthogonal to the stuff you put in, and that's going to give you a unbiasedness condition. And so then, relative to interval regression, you're going to you know, get efficiency results. So that's going to really be what drives everything. As I said, I know I'm kind of jumping over stuff pretty fast, but I want you to see what the intuition is. In other words, I need to approximate this complicated thing, this integral, in a way that I can interpret it vis-a-vis -vis finite data. That means find a basis for the object. I choose the basis in such a way it's explaining most of the variation in the x's. And that's why it's called functional principal components analysis. All right. So what I want to do, since I realize that, as usual, I'm going, I'm skipping many slides. I apologize to everybody. People have seen me talk before. No, it's my, it's, it's a standard sin. This is what I want to show you what happens for the PSID. All right. The red line is what the FDA analysis gives us. I want to contrast that to a sequence of interval regressions. If I assume the beta was constant, that's the first panel. Okay. So when I said there's compelling evidence, it's because if you were to take the square deviations of those two curves together, normalize suitably and ask, is it statistically significant? Yes. Now you can ask what happens when you start, I put in two intervals. I put in four intervals, five intervals, I go up to 20 intervals and you can see what's happening is exactly what I said, which is that if you contrast the interval approach to there and hence the panel approach and the limit to what we're getting, one of them is interpretable, has you know, uh, reasonably tight standard errors, the other is, uh, is, is simply unstable. So that's good. That, that's the methodological message. And that is that in trying to uncover the relationship, you want to think about these things as random functions living in a, in a space. You've got to find out, think about bases for the space. Not all, as a, not all bases are created equal. Some of the values that are there, the function differently than others. And so consequently, the art, you know, and the key results, and I want to be clear, this is, you know, Chang Park type results is that the functional principal components analysis has important optimality properties in trying to uncover uh, uncover what's going on. All right. So, going to use the PSID, and we're and, and so I misspoke. I should have said we actually go zero to twenty in the paper, and um, and and then we're going to uh, basically calculate these objects. Paper discusses how to come up with measures of, uh, of standard errors and things. It's going to be basically using the leave one out cross validation. I was going to call those important technical details, but those are going to be things that I'm going to uh, push on the side. All right, everybody with me? I want to actually talk about the empirical results. 
So the first thing to say, and, I, and as I said, I already, I unfortunately gave away the uh, denouement of the, uh, of the melodrama early on, our estimates of the beta function, the trajectory, exhibit this monotonicity. In other words, it's essentially monotonic from birth to, uh, uh, to age 18, and then it drops uh, at, uh, at, at the end. And so that's kind of the important result here. I would say that, interestingly, if you, if you were to sum those up, integrate them, uh, uh, to be a little more precise, you get an estimate of 0.3. This, the, the integral is 0.365 not all that dissimilar from what you would get from the original model. In other words, I just ran the uh, linear model, but it's being distributed in a certain way. What's important, obviously, in thinking about this is that it, this monotonicity is suggesting that, on the, that the sensitivity of the outcomes is, 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 is largely increasing across the life course. Now, let me make a couple of comments there. One of them is that is not logically inconsistent with claims that early childhood investment has a higher rate of return, per se, than, than investments at different ages. And the reason for that is you have to determine what the uh, differences is across families in the levels of investments if you're going to ask what the income consequences are. All right. So even though this, as I said, this doesn't look, this looks surprising given claims in the early childhood literature, there is not a logical incompatibility. The second comment I want to make, and this had to do with the earlier questions, and you know, how would you think about mechanisms? I think that it speaks to something. Again, this is speculative, but I think important, and that is that in, the, in thinking about why, you know, what are the mechanisms that that link parental income to offspring income? When I say, you know, decompose those, the traditional approach, and you know, the Becker Tomes Lowry models, and, and there are many instantiations over the years, is that parents make investments directly in their kids. An approach that is not, you know, uh, this is again, a little self-serving is what I, you know, my own work has always said that actually what parents do is they buy things for their kids, but they're called memberships. So in other words, the parental income doesn't buy the, the tutor, it buys the neighborhood, it buys the school. And so I think that this is at least suggestive in thinking about uh, the importance of the composition of whatever the parent's income <laughs> to, to child uh, investment is, is it direct or does it have to do with in, this in, indirect investment in terms of locations? I say that partially because the Watka, uh, Harding, and Elward papers, I think, were pretty clear in, uh, in finding that parental income seemed for them to be more important in early childhood, and neighborhoods were more important in later childhood, or in, sorry, in adolescence. And I think all, everybody who's had a teenager sort of says, yeah, that sounds right. But the, into, the serious point is, is because what's happening in adolescence is that what one's income is doing is altering the socioeconomic, the structure, social structure in which the children are functioning. Okay, so that's kind of what I think is there. Now, the other question, thing that was brought up before is this also may tell you something about the types of parents we're dealing with. And, uh, and this is where the model uh, is, I, I would say that most of the intergenerational mobility models are, are frankly, they, they don't speak. And that is, there may be something different about families that have upward trajectories in income versus downward trajectories. <laughs> so the, the banal fact, they have different trajectories. And so, you know, from the perspective of the literature on, on let's see, the, 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 the psychology literature, these predictions are actually readily, readily interpretable because in the psychology literature would argue that one of the essential things that happens and then in the sociology literature, I thought, I don't want to uh, be, uh, be on generous in credit, is that families with different trajectories formulate different aspirations in their offspring. And so uh, just to give, give an example of that, uh, Andrew Churlin, a sociologist at Johns Hopkins, who does ethnography of downwardly mobile white men, one of the things that he found in that work was a uh, deterioration of the belief in education over time. And so I would say the conventional story, a, a, uh, a representative story in the ethnographic work is interviewing down, you know, men whose incomes have gone down across time who say that, well, my parents thought it was really important. I go to college, it was essential. My view is it's up to my kids. And so that's what I'm trying to say is that I think there's a whole set of issues in modeling aspirations that these trajectories are likely speaking to. Okay, does that make sense? Hi, hi, Steve. I'm, I'm wondering if I can ask a, a comment or ask a question about this incredibly fascinating paper. And I want to build on the last thing you just said, which is that, you know, parents with different 
uh, uh, income profiles probably have very different consequences for their children. I would have thought, however, that those consequences included different profiles for the children themselves. That is to say, the focus here is on how the profile affects permanent income for the children. My guess is that profiles probably have implications for profiles. Oh, I let me let me say first of all, I 100% agree. Second, I um, I did something which is sloppy in terms of the literature review, which is in the paper, but it was not in the slides. And that is, is an extremely interesting paper by two sociologists, uh, Si Wing Cheng at um, at NYU and Si Shang, who is at Penn who actually try to map trajectories to trajectories. The yeah. methodology is completely different. Okay. So it, it, the, the, it didn't, explaining the relationship between their paper and this one it, it is, is, is non-trivial, but I wanna emphasize that that idea has appeared in a fascinating paper. And they, what they wanted to do is basically see whether or not uh, you can get statistics of the trajectories that are, are positively associated. And so I think that that's a, I, I take the, I, I, I think that that comment is spot on and it, and it let me uh, uh, redress an error in the, in the discussion of literature. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Thanks, Steve. All right. So first big idea, you've got this upward trajectory, you know, it, these do makes you want to, you know, or, you know, figuring out what it means is of course is the next step. The second thing I want to say is that you can actually now ask questions about um, kind of what trajectories lead to upward mobility, which ones lead to downward mobility. In other words, one question is just say, here are the trajectories. Another question, which you know, it goes back to looking at a different statistic, is to say, you know, what you know, what gets gets families to move up, what gets them to move down, and uh, of course, if you're in the uh, in the top, uh, there's only one place to go. Uh, and so, you know, one recognizes, of course, there's gonna, this is a little bit sensitive to how you divide categories up. But what I wanna say is that you can, you know, the, the types of exercises that are conventionally done in mobility measurement are gonna be, you divide the population into some, into, into, into you, know, you know, some divisions here we did quartiles and you can ask what, you know, it, you know kind of in absolute terms, who's moving up, who's moving down. Then what you can do is then ask questions about kind of what the, you know, and try to uh, define the sets of upward and downward mobility. Everybody with me? In other words, I take all the sets, some of them you have up, sometimes you have down. And then you can estimate logent models and sort of look at the trajectory profiles that are producing upward and downward mobility. And so what we basically what it's saying, if you want to predict upward mobility, you're going to get some relationship to the, uh, to the coefficient, to the uh, parental trajectories. Once you have those estimates, then I can ask which ones are predicting moving up, which ones are predicting moving down and characterize the two sets. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, what's happening here is that if you're looking at the mobility um, with respect to the intermediate classes, once you divide the, the trajectories up and ask which ones are leading to upward versus downward, you get, and you get a consistent story. It's, and and you, in some sense, you knew this had to be true from the coefficients. And that is the downward mobility is associated with the, down, the parents having derivatives within the life courses moving them down, whereas the upward mobility is associated with the, with the people moving up. Now, let me just also add in, in Manea's uh, earlier comments asking about the differences in the parents. This is parenthetically, I think just a good example where you have to treat immigrants differently than native born. In other words, if, I, you know, if, if you said identify trajectories of parental incomes that start modest, move up, in which you have massive upward mobility, and I get to condition on, on the location of birth of the parent, you know that I could, I could do that. And so your question, understanding the differences, a lot of that, you know, in, in to me, the, you know, the way to constructively proceed is to say for which question, what are the additional conditioning variables to put in? So if you ask me about what is it about, you know, the upwardly mobile trajectories that's doing it, I think one interesting thing is to distinguish the children of immigrants from others. Okay, but again, I think that that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's a pragmatic answer as opposed to a principled one. Okay, so that's, let me, let me kind of push on. I have a very quick question yeah, here actually please. on the data. Um, I was thinking that um, when when things go well, they sort of will go well for many people. So is this something that's related a little bit to the state of the economy cycle or you know how long um, how long of a span this this covers? Um, 
Well, I, in principle, the answer would be yes. Now, you know, the, the, the you know the PSID one of its its virtues is that it's it's been around for decades, and so uh, the idea is that you take pretty large swaths of averages for, of trajectories, um, and so let's to focus on the kids. If I'm looking at a 20 year interval, then your question is: what, If you think about the American economy during the the period where we have the data. How much difference was there across co the cohorts where we can do the measurements there i don't think uh the, the, that's first order on the other hand in talking about absolute mobility that is always going to be partially dependent on the aggregate economy and so when people talk about the fact that 90 percent of children born in 1940 ended up with higher incomes than their parents and it's 50 50 for people born in 1980 there's a good reason. Well, I say one of the reasons for that's called the Great Depression, uh -huh. <laughs> and the uh, the uh, and the and the birth of the, uh, the 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 true American Empire. And so I'm not I'm trying to be funny, but the serious point is obviously that's going to drive things. And so I think that that's an, that's an that's an issue that you have to think about when you're trying to interpret the absolute mobility numbers. One of the arguments that's made in fa in favor of focusing on relative mobility is, in some sense, that's. Uh, conditioning out the uh, the macro variables. Yeah. But my view is on the distinction between absolute and relative mobility, it depends on what question you're interested in. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, the, you know and, and so that, and there's no reason to prioritize, to, to prefer one over the other. I mean, well, I'll put it there. I have reasons to prefer absolute mobility, but I'm not gonna say that means that other people should agree with them. It's just a judgment about, you know, a normative judgment about the things that worry me in societies. And what worries me is people that are in absolute sense not doing well, or families that are in an absolute sense, and this is something for the future work in terms of kind of getting more information out of the trajectories, trying to identify bottlenecks. In other words, what are configurations of family structure and income where at that location, it's just hard to get through. And again, that's a trajectory idea. All right. So that's why I'm going to say kind of baseline stuff on the basic model. This is what I meant when I said that one can generalize the model to have a, a uh, interactions across uh, incomes at different ages. You know, from the vantage point of, of theories of poverty traps, affluence traps, et cetera, this is exactly not how you go. This is, the, is how, I heard how one proceeds in order to do something empirically. And nevertheless, there's, uh, I, I, there's actually a, a clarity here. In, in the structural form because you know, the, the, the complementarity and substitutability is actually reduced down to coefficients, okay? So you can estimate exactly the same model and this, these are two uh, uh, you know, pictures that will kind of illustrate things. And so uh, blue uh, means that you have it is negative and, uh, and red is positive. Uh, I won't comment on the uh, the mapping to politics, but the, here here's the point. So you can have uh, uh, all right. So here's the two things to say. One of them is this is actually what what the entire matrix of uh, of values looks like across years. And then if you were to set a very modest statistical significance requirement, this is what's left over. And this and this is what I meant when I said that you actually estimate this matrix of cross partials. Then you can ask questions about where do you get complements, where do you get substitutes, and what you end up with is the main complementarities are between the ages, the late early childhood and late adolescence. The substitutability is, is modest within early childhood. It's much stronger in later childhood. All right. I have a guess about this last one. I'm not sure whether there's a, 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 a missing observation there. I have a guess that, that the, the reason you're getting... Uh, getting so much substitutability in, in, in adolescence is that if, if my conjecture is correct, that the key is buying a house, then it actually does, you basically have some income that lets you afford it and the, and the details of the years is not gonna be essential. But in any event, this is what I meant when I said that there's something here that relative to kind of, a, I don't a, a folk wisdom that everything is a compliment to everything else, you get some different results. The other thing I'll say that's interesting is that um, at least in, in, the, in, in our analysis, it's hard for us to find stuff in kind of the ages four to six. And that's where a lot of the discussion of non-cognitive skills, personality traits focuses. Okay, so for better or worse, uh, uh, the data don't, are not speaking very clearly there. All right, so what one can then do is think harder about what it means to say there's a derivative of 
offspring income with respect to parental income. And what do I mean by that? The question you can ask is, you, know, you have a direct effect, that was the first term, but now you have interaction effects. In other words, if I raise the income today, I have consequences throughout the life course. And so what that lets one do is actually calculate kind of a linear effect, a nonlinear effect, an interaction effect. And one can then sort of compare the consequences of changes in income in a linear model versus a quadratic model. And so you'll get, you know, the basic findings are going to be that for, for poor families, the complement, the nonlinearity is exacerbating the sensitivity to the incomes. For rich families, it's attenuating it. And that's gonna be kind of this interplay of substitutes and complements. And so all I wanna say here is that if you actually wanna sort of fully understand the consequences of adding, of adding a dollar in a predictive sense, not a causal sense, obviously, you turn out getting a somewhat different vision of what the age specific IGE is if that's interpreted as a derivative. And so again, you're getting a more complicated story about the ability of parents uh, to exhibit resilience in a condition on where they start and, and kind of how they move. All right, I see I have five minutes left and I think I have uh, probably uh, 60 slides. So what to do uh, outside the usual thing, which is I, I, I screwed up, apologize. But let me just explain what we do in the next part. The next part is going to say is to introduce fam, uh, family structure. Okay. So obviously there's kind of, you know, I don't want to say it's, there's one hammer and everything's a, a nail, but you simply, again, you can take the same model and extrapolate that to say that you have the outcome of interest depends on the trajectory of family incomes and the trajectory of family structure. Now, this one is going to take the stance that you want to know whether or not you're living with your, your birth parents or not. That is clearly, okay, I was gonna say, that sounds like Burbank, California, 1965, in other words, where I grew up. And so I wanna be clear that taking a particular stance on how you, how you do the dichotomy on, uh, 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 on family structure. And I think that this is a weakness of the paper that needs to be addressed is to recognize that the, the, you know, the, the, the 50s, 60s, uh, you know, Southern California stereotype uh, for white middle-class people is not, is not the be all and the end all, but nevertheless, that's where this is. And so what you can end up with is you can demonstrate that you're getting uh, family structure trajectories that are more complicated. And unlike the income one, which is monotonically increasing, the family structure one is exhibiting a, uh, a bow shape. Now, this is not say it's good to get divorced when you're young. What it's saying is if you're looking at the total effects of separate <laughs> of a single parent on a child, the harms in, and later in life are very high. So in comparison to that, these are going to be positive. So you got to normalize that the right way. So that's kind of what's going to, that, that's kind of the big picture result there. And then what you can then do, of course, if you can do it once, you can do it twice. And that is look for interactions. That gives us these associated uh, uh, maps again. And this is what I meant that you're getting complementarity within early childhood and in later adolescence, but substitutability across the ages. And so in understanding the, you know, again, the, I, I, I'm going to call these just facts to think about in, for, in, in theorizing uh, about the interplay of family structure and, and family resources and how kids do. And again, um, for, for many of the years, it's very hard to pick anything up, but at least in the extremes, there does seem to be some interesting interactions. Okay, so let me then um, uh, skip all of this. And what the, all of that said was, do the same thing for occupation, do the same thing for education, and you get a coherent picture. In other words, that the family, the family income and family structure trajectories are mapping into occupation, are mapping into education in ways that are giving the coherent view of those as the, the, the proximate mechanisms that are providing a predictive content to, uh, uh, to, to eventual income. So, what are, what are the summary to be just very quick about it? The first is that information is being lost in the conventional method. There seems to be evidence in this data that the later incomes are particularly predictive of the outcomes. That is, and that leads, you know, almost as a to by, you know, by immediately as an implication that families that are exhibiting uh, improving prospects are going to have better, you know, the predictive outcomes for the kids are better than than families that are the opposite, even if they have the same permanent incomes. Same thing, second big point is that you find the family structure has a measurable distinct effect. 
That, by the way, was not obvious because you would have said the reason that a single parent household has because it has less income. But the point is that you can actually identify that. And then the third is that you can find a consistent story that works behind, between the proximate causes and the final causes. So all that together, I hope, has persuaded you that there's something interesting to think about in terms of trajectories. And, you know, this is just, as I said, you know, this is still kind of the scratch on the surface. These particular methods, which have been, you know, been developed in statistics over the last 30 years or so, have been, uh, uh, you know, only recently coming into, into economics, and I think they have some value. So that is the second, that's what I want to say about the talk. I wanted to end then with one comment. Um, as I said, the, uh, you know, the, the, there's a theorem that underlies all of this work, the Karhun and Loeb theorem, uh, which basically has to do with how to think about the existence of bases for the random functions. Um, some of you may see, have seen this book. This is uh, Loeb's classic book, Probability Theory. And, and, and that's actually where his, uh, this is a case where there was independent discovery. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is that I wanted to read to you the, uh, the dedication of the book. And the book is dedicated to the students and teachers of the school in the Camp de Drancy. I'm telling you that because the Camp de Drancy was an internment camp for French Jews. And Loeb had, was, had, been, um, had been picked up because he was Jewish and he was put in a concentration camp. Thank God he was not deported. And what, what I wanted to say is that that's, that's the spirit that beats, all, beats, beats evil. In other words, that in the worst circumstances, his genius manifested itself. But that's exactly what the Kiev school is doing. I mean it. The fact that you're functioning as scholars, you're functioning as scientists, at the same time as you're functioning as patriots, that's what puts tears in the eyes to the rest of the world. So thank you. Mr. Chair, it was a privilege to be one of 60 or so participants in this seminar. I hope it will be posted online soon. And uh, thank you, Steve. I really appreciated this. And, and I understand we will, we're not cutting off immediately. We may cut off recording immediately, but we will not cut off discussion uh, if, if there's, if there's good, and I yield the floor. Thank you.